Could you just explain, uh, Mr. Fred Allen, what treadmill to oblivion means? Why well, you called it that? Well, I called it that because any successful person, or especially a comedian who gets involved in the mechanized version of the entertainment world, has to compete with the machine. And, of course, he has to lose the battle because the machine is going to survive and the comedian... I treat comedians because I know more about them and was formerly and am currently an alleged comedian. But treadmill to... Well, you're on a treadmill if you're on... We did 700 and some odd hours during the 18 years we were on radio. And ultimately, the machine is still here, the microphone is still here, and I became ill. Not from reading the jokes, but I mean from pressure and work and sustained aggravation and things like that. I wonder if you you just read the last couple of lines in your book. Well, that that tells you. And the radio comedian's... Whether or not he knows it, the successful comedian is on a treadmill to oblivion. When a radio comedian's program is finally finished, it slinks down memory lane into the limbo of yesterday's happy hours. All that the comedian has to show for his years of work and aggravation is the echo of forgotten laughter and some receipts from the Treasury Department. (laughs) But that's sad. It is sad, but it's true. Everything that's true is sad, in a way. Echoes of... Forgotten, Forgotten laughter. In the spring of 1944, Fred Allen was finishing up his fourth season as host of the Texaco Star Theater on CBS. He'd been on the air for over a decade. It was while he was hosting Texaco on December 6, 1942, that Fred debuted Allen's Alley. Allen used to read a newspaper column by O.O. McIntyre called Thoughts While Strolling. McIntyre wrote about the sights and sounds he'd met walking through the shabby streets of New York's Chinatown in the Bowery. Allen felt that this kind of routine could come off very well on radio. A loudmouth politician had possibilities. Actor Jack Smart voiced Senator Bloat. John Doe was another early character. Portrayed by John Brown, Doe was an average man squeezed by life from all angles. Alan Reed voiced Flagstaff Openshaw, the poet. It was a wonderful device that Fred created, Alan's Alley. He always based his humor on current events, on topical things, which is why he was able to last so long and maintain so high a standard. He didn't have to dig in joke files and find jokes. He made his own jokes about things that were happening. There was a Greek restaurant owner, an old maid, and a Russian. The segment was always launched by Portland Hoffa asking what question Alan had for the alley occupants that week. Then they'd knock on various doors. Eventually, many of these characters gave way to the most popular incarnation of the alley, with Minerva Pius' Jewish Mrs. Nussbaum, Peter Donald's Irish Ajax Cassidy, Kenny Delmar's the Southern Senator Claghorn, and Parker Fenley's rural New England Titus Moody. How did you get started uh, with Alan's Alley and the uh, Oh, on? I worked on some special hour program, which is a mantra, and Fred was the... Uh, MC song, but they knew. I think that was the first time I ever met him. From that, he had me on his program. But Alan's Alley was on the air before I ever joined. I was with him three and a half seasons, a half season of television, which Fred was never happy in. Previously, he liked radio, I know, and he liked vaudeville. He was in vaudeville for years. But he never was happy at television. But Fred was very generous with everybody. Incidentally, only a couple of weeks ago, one of the people who used to be on the alley, Alan's alley, before I was, died. Alan Reed? Yes. He was real. He was... Well, Paul Slap Openshaw. That's right. No, he was on, I think, one or two programs that I worked on with Fred. But he had left as a city character before. His name was Bergman, was it? Yeah, Teddy Bergman was his mm-hmm. real name. Uh, Alan Reed was his stage name. And he did very well in California. He did that Flintstones. Uh, Fred Flintstone, the voice. Yeah. I saw him once when I was out there. And he got to be very heavy. But he, I read his obituary only. But Minerva Pius, Mrs. Nussbaum, she lives in New York now. I went to Cape Cod for some anniversary thing. Minnie was there, and Pete Donald. Pete Donald did uh, Ajax Cassidy, the Irishman, and uh, Senator Claghorn was Kenny 
Del Mar. He was also Cape Cod. The entire alley was allotted five minutes with laughter. Each character had 75 seconds for their lines. This was an issue because the program often ran overtime. It eventually caused the whole show to get cut off the air by network executives. Your troubles with radio executives came to a head one night when your Sunday night show was cut off the well, air. Well, many executives didn't come to a head, and that was our problem there. <laughs> that was our great problem in the, those days. That's what, true. What exactly happened? Can you tell us? We heard always about the vice president. Well, that's who, explained you know, in the book here, too. Uh, there's a script that explains the whole thing. It says, radio sure is funny, all except the comedy programs. Our program has been cut off so many times, the last page of the script is a Band-Aid. And then Portland says, what does NBC do with all of the time it saves cutting off the ends of your programs? And then I say, well, there is a big executive here at NBC. He's the vice president in charge of, uh-uh, you're running too long. And he sits in a little glass closet with his mother of pearl gong. And when your program runs over time, he thumps his gong with a marshmallow he has tied to the end of a xylophone stick. And bong, you are off the air. Then he marks down how much time he has saved. And then Portland says, well, what does he do with all this time? And then I say, he adds it all up, 10 seconds here, 20 seconds there. And when he's saved up enough seconds, minutes and hours to make two weeks, NBC lets the vice president use the two weeks of our time for his vacation. And Portland says he's living on borrowed time. And I say, and he's enjoying every minute of it. And that's why the man cut us off. He claimed that we were insulting the executives, and I claimed that it was impossible at that time with the executives who are rampant you know, on the network. It was impossible to insult them. But now, what was the real problem? They would cut you off a little early at night, or you would run long? And... Well, the problem was that it was impossible to judge the running time of a comedy show, because if your audience was exceptionally good, you might allow... We used to allow over five minutes and 30 minutes just for laughter. And some nights, if things were hilarious, or there were mistakes made, or ad living or things like that, uh, we'd be long, and uh, then we'd be nipped off without any warning at all, mm -hmm. you know, because you had to get the final... No, uh, I hate to be should... cut off. I get furious at well, night. Well, especially on a comedy show, because sometimes you spend all of the time, your, your premise is established, and your plot and all that, and you come to the end, and the end is gone. We were the first one, as far as I ever know, to put the end of the show on the next week and start with the beginning of it. <laughs> Oh, dear. But it just seemed that there was no flexible approach to the problems of the medium, you see. It was more important to get off on time than it was to be good. The New York Herald Tribune critic John Crosby later wrote that part of what made Fred's battles with censorship so difficult was the man assigned to review his scripts frankly admitted he didn't understand Alan's peculiar brand of humor at all. Regardless, the agency and network people couldn't argue with Alan's ratings. He was consistently a top-20 show, and in April 1944, he was being heard by more than 13 million people. On Easter Sunday at 9.30 p.m. New York time, his special guest was actor Reginald Gardner. Together they presented a sketch spoofing Sherlock Holmes called Fetlock Bones. It's Texaco time with Fred Allen. Texaco dealers from coast to coast present the Texaco Star Theater, starring Fred Allen, with Fred's guest, the popular cinema chap, Reginald Gardner, Portland Hoffa, Falstaff Openshaw, the Texaco Workshop Players, Hilo Jack and the Dame, and Al Goodman and his orchestra. This is Jimmy Wallington, suggesting that you see your Texaco dealer soon and change to the correct Texaco lubricant for spring. Thin, worn winter lubricants can't protect your car in coming warmer weather. With the correct grade of insulated Haviland motor oil, the right Texaco gear lubricants, and Marfax chassis lubrication, your car can run better and last longer. This is Easter Sunday, ladies and gentlemen, the day the little bunny leaves his colored eggs at your door. 
Tonight we can't bring you the little bunny and the eggs, but we can bring you a man who will give you a few old jokes. He's Fred Allen. Thank you, and I, oh, I just bit my tongue, Jimmy. The first piece of tender meat I've had for two months. I just, well, thank you, thank, thank you, and good. I owe myself seven points now. Thank you, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And Jimmy, I know uh, you had a big day today. I saw you this afternoon in the Easter parade. Oh yes. Did you like my outfit, my silk hat? Oh, Jimmy, your head looked as though it was hanging out of a ship's funnel there. <laughs> And those, those tan shoes you had on were snappy, too. Your feet looked like two omelets with buttons on them, as you... But how about that Easter lily I was carrying? The Easter lily, Jimmy? Yeah. You had the pot for it, James. <laughs> Say, Fred. Did you hear the people cheer as I went by? Oh, Jimmy, when your shirt front lit up and said, Follow me to a Texaco dealer, I was proud of you. <laughs> Oh, that was some parade today. It was a little chilly marching. Well, I know. It was so cold, some of the girls were mixing sterno in with their liquid stockings to keep their legs warm. It's a new <laughs> wrinkle they have with them. It was really a yes, lot... Mr. Allen! Well, poor... <laughs> your gesture, your left shoulder blade is in bloom, I see tonight. <laughs> You're just, uh, <laughs> you're just in the uh, in time, Portland. Jimmy and I were talking about the Easter parade. Oh, Mama and I were in the parade. Oh, were you really? Uh huh. Mama had a new hat. It's an off the face model. Oh, well, some of those off the face hats should be worn off the head from the look. <laughs> I saw a woman with a hat today. It looked like a pot roast relaxing on a pen wiper. <laughs> And the other woman with her had one of those little fur hats. You know, it looks like a blowout patch from a raccoon coat. Well, the woman had this little fur hat on. She looked as though a muskrat was backing out of her hair. It was quite a thing. Mama bought me a new hat. Really? It's a bread crust. A crust of bread is a hat? Mm-hmm. I go out wearing the bread crust. Uh-huh. In two minutes, my hair is full of sparrows. Full of sparrows, huh? It's a pretty effect. I, well... <laughs> I'll take your I'll take your word for it. You know, you could go out with nothing on your head and in two minutes you'd be wearing woodpeckers. <laughs> well, this has been a great Easter, Portland. It certainly was a big egg week. A big yes. week for eggs, wasn't Mr. it? Mr. Wilkie laid a big one in Wisconsin. I know. <laughs> yes, but Mr. Wilkie took his Madison like a man. <laughs> That reminds me, Portland. I'll think I'll, I think I'll see how the Republicans are doing down in Allen's Alley. What is your question tonight? Well, this past week, the OPA launched a drive to curb eating places throughout the city that had increased their prices. And so our question is, have you eaten in any restaurant lately where the food price ceilings have been violated? Shall we go? Well, as Mrs. Cassidy said to Mr. Cassidy, let's hop along. <laughs> <laughs> what a fat handle our mop has. I... <laughs> well, Portland, here we are back in Allen's Alley. I wonder if Senator Bloat is in. <laughs> yes? Uh, Senator Bloat? Yes, but you'll have to hurry. I'm working on a presidential campaign slogan for Governor Dewey. But no one knows if Mr. Dewey is going to run. That's my slogan. What? Dewey or don't he? <laughs> Very good, Senator. Tell me, how are you uh, are you doing anything about restaurants violating food ceilings? Yes, all food should be conserved. Conserved? How do you mean, Senator? If my bill, the bloat bill, goes through, all eating places will be closed except Chinese restaurants. Chinese restaurants. Mm-hmm. Well, what will people get to eat? Dehydrated egg foo young. What what is dehydrated egg foo young? There is no egg in it. No. There is no young in it. No. It's all. Food. <laughs> I think you. Well, I uh, I hope the senator remembers you can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Let's try next door. Well, what is it? I give up. I give up. I don't. Know. Mrs. Prawn, have you been victimized in any uh, restaurant? For 20 years, I've been having tea for nothing. I see buttered color tea shopping. Tea for nothing? 
I bring my own tea bag. I order a pot of hot water, and the hot water is free. Well, what was the violation? Yesterday, I went in with my tea bag. Yes? I ordered a pot of hot water. Yes? The waitress said hot water is ten cents a pot. And? I refused to pay. Well, when you refused to pay the waitress ten cents for hot water... She left me holding the bag. <laughs> Mrs. Prawn should report that to the OPA, the Orange Pico Association. Well, what can happen next door here? No? Ah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Rappaport, tell me, have you had any trouble with these food violations? Violations, he says. Only today I'm a victim. Well, what happened, Mr. Rappaport? I am going into Shapiro Salami Shangri-La. <laughs> Shapiro Salami Shangri-La? It's a delicatessen. Oh, I see. When ordering a jumbo tongue sandwich, it should be with pumpernickel. I see. The waiter is bringing the jumbo tongue sandwich, and on the check is marking 20 cents. You, sus- you suspected something? I am lifting up the pumpernickel. Yeah? I am looking on the tongue. Uh-huh. I am saying, for this Shapiro is charging 20 cents. Yes. The tongue is saying, confidentially... I am formerly only 15 cents with muscle. The tongue was a stool pigeon, hey? Well, what did, uh, what did you do? I'm calling back the waiter. You bawled the waiter out? I am ordering a bottle of seltzer water. You let them overcharge you for the tongue and you didn't say anything? No. Oi, I am drinking the seltzer water. And after you drank the seltzer water? Did they hear from me? <laughs> Well, that brings us to the little mock stucco cottage at the end of the alley. Rent the air with trumpets brassy, false staff come home again like lassies. Ah, false staff, you are concealing something under your loincloth there. More poems? Ah, oh, yes. Have you heard? My dentist is dead. I have no regret. For my false teeth clicked like two castanets. <laughs> No. Or, uh, he's cursing his draft board out of Fort Dix. If they waited a week, he'd have been 26. <laughs> no. Or, uh, my mother's beard grows longer daily. She's had two offers from Barnum and Bailey. Now, wait a minute, Paul Staff. You're turning this into a horror program. Why don't you, uh, pay attention here? Tonight we're discussing the OPA's campaign against restaurant violations. Precisely why I confront you. All right. What is your food... What is your food violation form called? The meatballs lament. The meat... <laughs> the meatballs lament. How does it go? A little meatball on a plate ruefully started to meditate. The meatball sob, for my plight today, there's no one to blame but the OPA. Cooked weeks ago, I'm still not sold. My outside is lumpy, my inside is cold. The meatball continued, its voice was tense. On the menu, I missed it at 60 cents. But the OPA says 30 cents is my ceiling. That's why I'm here with my gristle congealing. Doomed for the nonce on my plate to stay until my status is checked by the OPA. The OPA head, Mr. Chester Bowles, they think that meatballs have no soul. But I'll wager him odds at ten to seven. When a meatball dies, it goes to Hamburg heaven. Thank you, Paul Staff. Now, Paul Staff, the meatballs champion, proves that he knows his onions. And at the mention of onions, Maestro Goodman brushes a furtive tear from his eye so that he may see Hilo Jack and the dame approaching. Tonight, the kids sing, Wish I May, Wish I Might. Wish I may, wish I might Get the wishes I'm wishing tonight A young cadet, blonde or brunette A Romeo in search of beauty And wish I might, wish I may Get the wishes I'm wishing today A lot of boys, a lot of noise and an awful lot of boys He wants a day to stay out late A brother rat who leave me flat For great forms and more Get from New York A raft of pasta will be round me And the blast will help me And they will cheer For the fellas of all of the year So hold me close 
Jimmy Walling. Here you are, Fred, my song for tonight. Now, wait, Jimmy. Tonight we are not singing another one of your commercial songs. Uh-huh. We're singing one of mine. You? You've written a song? Jimmy, you are looking at the author of Little Brown Car. <laughs> Little Brown Car? Mm-hmm. Who? How can that remind drivers that spring is here, warmer weather's coming, and Texaco dealers are ready to replace those old worn winter lubricants with the correct Texaco product to prevent excessive warm weather wear? Just made it, didn't you? Well, Just look, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> My, uh... <laughs> Looks as though we may have to look around for a man with more wind on this program. Well, now, what you say is true, Jimmy, but in my song... Oh, nonsense. How can it say that cars are getting older and the right spring grade of Texaco's insulated Haviland motor oil is more important than ever? And that Marfac lubrication is a pepper-upper for the 40 vital points of the chassis? How can your song say, see your Texaco dealer first to make your car last? Well, I'll show you how my song can say it, Jimmy. Mr. Goodman, please. <laughs> a car, it's painted brown, it's a pretty old car, but it's not run down, you should hear that motor sing, Texaco's got it set for spring, Texaco, you and me, little brown car, how I love thee, hidey ho, off we go, little brown car with Texaco. was not uh, very mucho, a besame mucho, played by, <laughs> played by, L. wait, Mr. Goodman wants to laugh. Now, everybody quiet while Mr. Goodman laughs. All right. Played by Al Goodman and his serenading son-in-laws, or sons-in-law. I don't, uh, say, Portland, what are you reading there? Is Dick Tracy in trouble again? No, it's a program. Oh. Mama and I went to the racetrack opening. Oh, that's right, Jamaica. Jamaica track did open yesterday. Did your mother win any money? Well, Mama only made one bet. She lost. Oh, her horse was slow, hey? Mama said he ran like a Crosby horse with Sinatra riding him. <laughs> well, that should be a new record in something, but Frankie would make a great jockey. You know, Sinatra only weighs about 80 pounds with his pivot too thin. <laughs> Tell me, did the, uh, did the new racing taxes bother the crowd at the track? Oh, not the people, only the horses. The taxes bothered the horses? In the first race, when the winning horse came down the stretch, yeah. on his back he had a jockey and two tax collectors. On the one horse. Three men on a horse. I saw the play years ago. Well, well, I'll buzz along, Portland. I have to do some research on my Sherlock Holmes play. Are you an authority on Sherlock Holmes? An authority? Why, I got Dr. Watson to join the Needleworkers Union. If I can find an... <laughs> Why don't you go over in the corner and enjoy it alone? I'll just... <laughs> Look, if I can find, if I can find an actor with an English accent, Portland, for my mystery, I'm all set. Well, can't we get Nigel Bruce? No, Willie, uh, as we call uh, Nigel in Hollywood, Willie is tied up out there. He's making a sequel to I Walked with a Zombie. It's called The Zombie Came Back Without Me. (laughs) Isn't there another actor with an English accent you can get? Well, I read in a gossip column in Pravda that, uh... That Reginald Gardner was in town. I think I'll go over to Reggie's hotel. I'll see you later, Portland. Yes? Well, Reginald Gardner. (laughs) 
Reggie, what are you doing sitting on that hot water bag? Well, I've uh, I've just finished a USO tour in the Arctic region, Fred. I can't get thawed out. Oh, really? And uh, are those goose pimples on the end of your neck? Uh, yes, this big goose pimple that's doing the talking is my head. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, Reg... <laughs> Reggie, while, while you're getting defrosted now, if you're not doing anything the next few days... Well, I'm pretty busy, old man. I'm getting ready to play some more army camp. Oh, I see. I was just rehearsing my imitations as you came in. Oh, really? What, uh, what do you imitate? Oh, different things. Have you heard this one? Hi there! Hi there! What is that? Well, that's one end of a worm greeting his other end. <laughs> Is that, uh, is that all there is to it? Yes, for reasons known only to itself, the other end of the worm never replies to the greeting. Oh, I see. <laughs> it's blunt with the first end. Yeah. Well, uh... And now, here's another one of my impersonations. Wiggle, wiggle, brrr. Wiggle, wiggle, brrr. Wiggle, wiggle, brrr. What is that? That is a snake crawling over an ice cream cone. <laughs> Well, in, uh, in your imitations, it seems, everything talks. Yes. Have, have you ever heard a little windshield wiper on a cheap car? The windshield wiper talk? Of course it does. It says, it isn't you, it isn't you, it isn't you, it isn't you. Well, that's swell. <laughs> and then there's the windshield wiper on the big car or a truck. Well, what does that say? Beef tea. Beef tea. <laughs> Beef tea. You know, uh, I do imitations too, Reggie. Really? Oh, yes. Are you, uh, would you like to hear one? I'd love to hear one, Fred. Bob White, you all. Bob White, you all. Bob White, you all. It's a southern Bob White. <laughs> but, Reggie, I didn't come over here to ban the impersonations. I want you to appear in a new mystery play I've written. Oh, no, but uh, I'm no dramatic actor, Fred. I'm a comedian. Well, you can play this part. No, I'd probably get a lot of laughs and crumb it up. Did you say crumb, Reggie? Where did you, an Oxford man, pick up a word like crumb? Lend leaf, old boy. <laughs> well, look, Reggie, if you'll do my play, we can make a picture out of it. Well, I've just finished the make making a picture, Fred. Oh, a mystery? No, it's a comedy. It's the new Jack Benny picture. Well, if there's any comedy in a Benny picture, it's a mystery, Reggie. <laughs> Oh, no, really. Jack's swell in this picture, Fred. It's called The Horn Blows at Midnight. Look, they have to blow a horn in all of the Benny pictures to keep the audience away. <laughs> they have a man named Horn Blow there who just works on Benny pictures. <laughs> when, ben... <laughs> when Benny's pictures play in New York, they even let civilians in for 28 cents. <laughs> Reggie, everyone knows you can do comedy. You should try a dramatic role. Now, you might be another Basil Rathbone. Fred, do you think the world is ready for another Basil Rathbone? <laughs> I think some post-war plan about Rathbone should be brought up. <laughs> you know, you can get your eyes pulled out a little and your hips lowered and be another Peter Lorre. Well, what's this play of yours about? It's a murder mystery solved by a man the world has never heard about until tonight. Sherlock Holmes' brother-in-law, Setlock Bone. This case is called the Pekingese of the Basketville. As the play starts, we hear a crescendo of dramatic music. In the annals of crime detection, no figure looms larger than Sherlock Holmes' brother-in-law, Fetlock Bone. As our story opens, it is a foggy night in London. Fetlock and his friend, Dr. Potson, are at home in their little flat on Baker Street. Dr. Potson is deep in the study of anatomy. An esquire lies open in front of it. <laughs> Fetlock Bones. <laughs> Fetlock Bones is pacing the floor, playing his violin. Uh, I say, Bones. Yes, Potson. Uh, that tune you're playing, uh, what is it? It's a new American tune called Mersey Dotes and Does Do Likewise, and Little Lambsies are up to something. <laughs> Oh, no. I see the telephone. I shall take it, Parson. Are you there? Are you there? Yes, are you there? No, I'm here. Well, you must be there. I'm here. Can you come here? Where is here? Not far from there. Oh, well, I shall... <laughs> I shall be there. Well, I shall be here. Righto. Righto. Cheerio. 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 
Watson Quick, me Rayon Burberry, me Peter Cap, me Needle, me Spike Jones records. I'm off. <laughs> There's been dirty doing. I'm off to Basketville Mansion. <laughs> Thank you. I am Fetlock Bone. And I am... I know, I know. You are Mr. Baskerville's butler, Rancy. You were born near Surrey with the fringe on top. <laughs> you have no shin in your right leg. Your father raises aspidistas, and you have a cousin, Cecil, who has a punctured eardrum. Amazing, Mr. Bone. How did you know? I'm on your draft board. <laughs> What is the two do here? The two of Mr. Baskerville's guests have disappeared. This house is cursed, Mr. Bowden. Isn't there some legend about Baskerville Mansion? Yes, sir. Whenever the Pekinese is heard barking, someone dies. That's it. The Pekinese of the Baskerville. I don't like it, sir. The Pekinese has barked twice tonight. Where is your master, Barkley Baskerville? He's in the trophy room. I shall announce you. Announce him, Mr. Fetlock Bowden. I'm Barkley Basketville. Come in, Mr. Bowen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see what magnificent trophies you have here on the wall. That lion's head is a river old boy. Yes, potted the beggar with my second shot. And the first shot? Potted my guide. <laughs> this is the guide's head mounted on the other wall with the cow lick and the dimple. Yes, fortunately he was smiling at the time. <laughs> Lightens up the room, don't you think? Rather, rather. Who does your taxidermy? Uh, Moxton, the bird stuffer on Fleet Street. Moxton. <laughs> you can't miss Moxton. He has a weasel throttling a young rabbit in the window. Oh, I see. What are these trousers you have mounted over here? I fired at a panther. The panther got away, but he lost his pants. <laughs> lost his pants? <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> Lost his pants. That's a rouser, Baskerville. <laughs> it is a bit of the old rowdy down, what? Right you are. But let's get down to business. I hear you've had unpleasantness here tonight. Unpleasantness? A bit of it, yes. Two house guests done in. A bit of the old eerie or Jell-a -lack or Delaware like a Warner or something. Oh, that? Oh, well, there's nothing you can do about that, old boy. You know the curse of Baskerville Mansion. You mean the Pekingese of the Baskerville? It's been going on for centuries. Whenever the Pekingese barks, Someone died. I understand the Pekingese has had a go at the acoustics tonight, old boy. Twice, old man. My party is going to the dog. Party is going to the dog? Oh! Going to the dog. Oh, oh, oh. Who, are, who are your guests, old fruit? We're holding a class reunion. What school? Oxford, Cambridge? No, Chislich on the office. Oh, Chislich. Top Hall Academy. Thank you. Thank you. Where are you holding the reunion? In the turmoil room, through this door. I believe my mates are singing. Here's to the our Emma Mesa, to our classmates, young and old. Here's to Tizzlitz on the attic, your tradition we air at home. Wrong, wrong, wrong! We know what from which. Chisel, chisel, chisel it! But definitely. Oh, darling. <laughs> 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 uh, classmates of Chiselet on the office. May I present Fetlock Bones? Bones, this is Sippy Hollister. How do you do? You do. Marmaduke Smith Smythe. You do. You do. Pennington <laughs> Sunset. Uh, you do. You do. And H. H. Buddle, recently returned from America. How do you do, sir? I beg your pardon. I said, how do you do? Terribly sorry, or jargon. I can't understand you. How do you do? <laughs> what is this blighter trying to say? He means uh, to do. Oh, to do, to do. do. <laughs> yes, uh, Buffalo has been in America. Try to allow the colonies poop about with some other term. <laughs> too true, too true, old man. But what about those chaps who disappear? It's filthy, Mr. Burns. We were playing bridge. The lights went out, the door barked, the shot rang out. Well, the lights came on and they were gone. Constantly yes. first in Leffingwell. They both sat in the same chair. Show me exactly what happened. Uh, right, oh. Uh, let's play another hand of bridge, mate. Will you sit in, Bones? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Marmaduke, will you sit in that vacant chair? Right, sir. We're ready, Basketville. Uh, let me see. I did one half. Uh, two spades. I knock with three. I'm Schneider. I say the lights are off. <laughs> the Pekingese of the basket. <laughs> 
Right. Uh, oh, there only, Kate. I see. Marmaduke's gone. That blasted dog barked again. The Pekingese of the basket bill. Oh, Bones, do something. Three chiselled men have been done away with today. Yes, and each sat in the same chair. I shall take the fingerprint. Nobody touched the chair, Bones. They just sat in it. Sorry, I'm not equipped for prints that large, old boy. <laughs> There's only one thing to do. We shall reenact the crime. You, Buddle, sit in that chair. Not that chair. It's the chisel edge, Buddle. The chisel edge. Right, old Bones. And now, Basket Bill, we'll play another hand of bridge. Who's bid? The lights. They're off again. <laughs> the Pekingese of the Basket Bill. Let go of my hand. Who's holding my hand? Not so fast, matey. The lights, Buddle. Quickly, the lights. They're on, they're on, Bones. The mystery is solved, Buddle. Here sits the murderer. The co who has done in your free chisel itch classmate. Barkley, Basket Bill. Right, oh. This is preposterous, Bones. You can't prove anything. Oh, no? Then how do you account for this revolver strapped under the bridge table? Surely a coincidence. And this push button under the table. When you push it... See? A trap door. Sweeney Todd fashion under the chair gives way. Just a place for old razor blades. But no. <laughs> How do you explain the Pekingese barking? The dog is concealed in the basement. This other button sends a spark down and gives the Pekingese a hot paw. I suggest you confess, Baskerville. Yes, Bones, you've got me with my confession down. <laughs> You murdered your chiselage classmate. I had to, the foul blighters. Foul blighters, Barclay. The purpose of our class reunion was to present you with a purse of a million pounds sterling. I knew, Buddle. That's why I had to murder the entire class. You had to kill them because they were going to give you all this money? The gift tax on a million pounds today is a million and a half pounds. I see. If, <laughs> if you had accepted the gift... I would have been ruined. The class would have wiped me out. So instead... I wiped out the class. Whoa! <laughs> Fred Allen speaking for Texaco dealers from coast to coast, reminding you that gasoline powers the attack, and don't waste a drop. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Unfortunately, the fight was getting to Fred Allen. After this season, he quit the Texaco Star Theater as high blood pressure forced him off the air.